Bonjour Anin, voici comme Ganin, Manadok de Go, Edward George, Doge Shoganashin Klaas, Sagin Donjba, Shkabe with Ganin Dao. So I just said in my language uh, my name, the spirit name I was given, my English name. I'm from the Sagin First Nation on the southeastern shores of Lake Huron. Our ancestor, as we were talking about, um, I'm a helper. Like some of the assertions that like education is not in the contemporary class settings. It's it's on the land. When we're talking about being indigenous, like you know, you you can't remove that from language, land, yeah, kinship. Um, I would even say water, because we are a water based people. We we don't quite know that about ourselves anymore an incredible fear with being on the water that we have yeah. and it's like we were never ever like that it's it's incredible that that piece um as well with this part about like um what was it like some of like passing along knowledge for me i'm not an elder we never yeah. You know, like, and then what does it mean to hold knowledge? Um, a lot of people would, like, look at those words and it's like a status that you somehow get to this place and now it's like a, it's like a social construct, but it's really about the relationship that you have to that piece of knowledge, the way that it's shaped your life, the way that um, you work, you work with that particular way. So if it's language, understanding the binaries of our expression as peoples, um, for me, one of the one of the big things is canoe, like the canoe, like paddled across the Great Lakes. You know, like there's a relationship there with the water, with the canoe. Um, how 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 do I, as a human, hold that? It's not easy. So, like especially being a young person. So I, I feel like um, you know it, it. It's about relationship. It's about um, those seven grandfather teachings that we that we talk about. Um, one of the things that people don't realize, a lot of us don't realize is that, and I didn't know this starting out, that, you know, when they say um, seven grandfathers, do we assume that they're these old men sitting up in the ether somewhere in a lodge just waiting to hear from the Nishnabe? Like, who are they really, you know? And when we go back to the land, the memory of where we came from, we know that the animals were the ones to first teach us how to live here. We, as a people, I would say as a human species, have der derived all of our knowledge to date from them. We have the creative ability inside of ourselves to, to take that knowledge and change it a little bit. Academia seeks to expand and flesh, flesh out all of those things to create a discourse that um, create a particular area in which somebody's able to articulate that whole space right that is that all derives back to to the animals the seven grandfather teachings are the seven clans the seven families of animals so the ones with um, hoofs the ones with talons the ones with sticked feet, the ones who live in the water, like the turtle and the fish, the ones who have web feet, the ones who have large paws, and the ones who have small paws. You know, those are the seven grandfathers. When we say grandfather, we're not talking about the human grandfather. Like that, that's those are our ancestors. That's Atzokan, Atzokanak. They the ones that went ahead of us. You know. A lot of our, we're not told a lot of these things, you know, like that when, like the grandfathers are the ones who, at various point in our story, how we evolved, how we learned to be who we are and have these complex systems, you know, that were land-based, that never left the earth. A lot of the spaces that we're in now is like elevated disconnected like even when we wear shoes like it's all insulated we're insulated from that actual connection um 
those those systems of knowing whether that be language whether that be like navigation that's particularly where i'm where i'm at now is that navigation part like um anishinaabe king the land that we're from we know conversely as turtle island a lot of us don't know why we call it turtle island that when you look at the continent it's a turtle that's getting ready to dive into the ocean right um this the places when we look at for example colonization we know it came from the east and it spread as that happened our people fled the the, the ones who are, were responsible to carry a lot of this knowledge and a lot of it went underground some of it went so far underground we don't know if it'll ever reemerge. some of it was stolen and is now being held captive in cultural institutions um, you know, this, this navigating this nation of ours, this responsibility that we have, um, for me is where education is going because we're starting to recognize that we can no longer just articulate and express things that were never meant to be written down on paper anyways, like, cause it's a very extractivist and reductionist way of, of doing things, you know? why why would we just put it outside of ourselves on a piece of paper at some point we have to be that embody it and, and do it right and so navigating physical spaces and, and the geographies of our of where we're from being in the of the great lakes like that's a whole other piece too like i, I was told by a friend of and it, like this knowledge is common amongst people when you travel around. So it's always expressed in a different way, which is again, the, the danger and the challenge of academic, Western academic spaces, because you always have to cite your, your source. And, and it's to like, so that you can have a place marker to actually go back and envelop, like, or discover more of what that person had worked on, um, but also to, to provide credit to where that thought originated. We belong as a species to a, a collective consciousness as well. Like we are a we, not just single units. Like so, the knowledge that we can find it exists in different forms, different ways of expressing it as in relation to the land, in in relation to our families or how we're all connected, right? For that time and space. So say myself as being a knowledge, a holder of knowledge, or someone who's taking care of knowledge. In, in, in a lot of respects, like when I'm talking about the Great Lakes, I'm saying that like, and, and the way that I've heard it expressed was that it, it doesn't belong to us. We belong to them and they are a them, right? It, they're not an it. They're, they're responsible for our very existence. The Great Lakes at 36 or 37 million direct dependence, human dependence every single day are hosting our very ability to have this conversation. Um, and so the notion that to take something outside of ourselves, to write it down, makes it unalive. You know, our people had a custom, a practice of putting knowledge down in the form of drawings, right? because because of the story of colonization that these things the 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 systems that maintain them that were in relation to them that took care of them were under threat like our clan system when i was telling you those those are dodemuk that was one of the first things that wasn't allowed to be anymore that was one of the first things to go down into the depths right like and like I said, some of it went so far, you know, we have, we have to be brave to, to go, to, to dive deep and, and to recover that, to understand the ways that our people were, but it's like, I see Indigenous education as being that investigation, you know, in, in a way that is inside the body, in a way that's, that, that meet, like, if, if all we're doing this for is for a position paper at the end of the day, how does that serve the people that we started this journey for.
you know, we always have to be thinking about, you know, the little snotty nosed res kids. I, you know, we were all once those snotty nosed res kids, right? And and some of the things that we had to experience as those little people, you know, like when we really we we go into academia to understand what happened, why, why did that happen? The, that was by design, by very careful design that was perfected over hundreds of years on other parts of this planet, right? And um, we're challenged to face that at the same time. You know, I, I feel like the most useful thing that I could pass on, like holding holding knowledge, um, that knowledge is also holding me. Just the same way that we, we belong to the Great Lakes system, it doesn't belong to us. The knowledge that can be obtained, right, can be, it, it, it's not an ownership of those things. It's not about an ownership. It's about recognizing that they're the, like, say, for example, sacred items, a, a water drum, a pipe, you know, a sweat lodge, any of those things that um, help us to be well, to maintain our spirituality, to maintain who we are. We don't, like when they say pipe carrier, when they say drum keeper, it's actually the other way around. It's the drum that keeps us. It's the pipe that, that carries us. Some would say like um, grandfather William Commanda, you know, before he passed, like that was something that he shared a lot about, you know, like he, he took care of the belts of our nation, like the wampum, you know, and he would never say that he car he was a, a wampum belt carrier. He, he said, no, they carry me and, and they own me. They, they have an agency too. They have a dream. Our people never did things like even the items that they carried had spirit, had life. That's how alive they were, that they could literally imbue life into an otherwise inanimate object. They all have a spirit. They all have even a name. You know, our Jimon, our Jimonuk, like the canoes, they're coming back. Every community all over the all over the places, they're all making them. What are they making them for? What are we as a people being prepared for? That's my encouragement to young Indigenous people, you know, is like pay attention to what's happening close to the earth. Pay attention to what's happening in the water, in the sky. You know, the, the hierarchies and the systems that we're being petitioned to maintain are dying in a world of abrupt and irreversible climate change. Like, it's a, this isn't a luxurious or um, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to be educated, right? We had to fight hard for that. We had to, a lot of our people had to become assimilated for that, to leave the forests and and to go into these spaces, you know, and, and we're being asked to change them from the inside. Part of the present um, encouragement is like, you, you have to have this type of education in order to be successful, in order to survive in this world. And I would challenge that because that, mentality and that those mess that messaging came out of the residential school experience you know that's what we were told by our grandparents that's what we were told by our parents that we have this is what we have to do we can no longer be indians as we're being assimilated in these urban settings we're leaving we've left the forests the forests are being plundered you know resource extraction is the basis of the economy here you know that's a staple way of life. People don't question that. The only ones that are left questioning that are the ones who, who refuse to leave the forest, you know. And our relations, the ones who make us Indigenous, the ones who first educated us about how to be a human being, they're concerned about their lives. Their lives are in, in jeopardy, like their homes, their way of being, their, their voice, their rights, like... You know, they're petitioning us to come back and help, you know. Um, they're also worried about their great-grandchildren's futures, too, you know. And, and, and I feel like that's why we have to um, do these investigations, why we have to look in 
and pay attention and start to get our minds around what can we actually do. It's, like, it's not a, a luxurious experience. It's, it's a practical urgency, you know, that we have to respond. And the other thing I would um, share is that, um, you know, we have an incredible opportunity um, to make a, a, to push through a lot of these colonial um, barriers. Like we've been kind of pinned up, rounded up and penned, you know, as a people. And we have like, there's some of us who have been brave enough to just like jump out with a pen and go. Um, I mean, I'm particularly encouraged by those people because they're the ones doing the heavy lifting of, of our nation, unpaid, unrecognized, you know, it's heavy, it's hard. It's harder than it just engaging with it purely as an, an intellectual experience. It, it impacts your life, physical well-being, you name it, right? And a lot of the spiritual ways that we have can help us to maintain our wellness while we while we do that. So it's like we're not alone. We were never like our ancestors thought far ahead. The things that they foresaw happen happening, they've all happened. You know? They thought of us. We we weren't left to just dwindle. Like it's like a like a flashing light that slowly goes out. That that's where we have been, but that's not our only story now. You know, we are coming back in a big bold new way, right? We get to define that. The colonial constructs, even within academia, might um, have, have the ability to almost prevent us from really seeing that real opportunity. Because whenever we're be being educated in the contemporary sense, it's always to go in within the system. But we have our own systems and they are coming back and there are people that are dedicated to that. Um, to me, that's where, when I see Indigenous education, I see a time where that that is a mainstay understanding that we've already, okay, there was these generations that did go through that post-secondary system. They have found ways in and out to utilize it for what it's actually for and, and understand what it's not for. Be able to go home to their communities, drive forward what's needed, what's been in waiting for years, right? Like, these are, this has been a long time coming, you know, and there are people that have been sitting at home, you know, living their lives and waiting for that time. They're waiting and they're, and they're like, you know, let, let, let's go and meet them. There are relatives, let's go and sit with them and, and hear what they have to say because they, they know the land. They know where everything's at. They know where the medicines are. And they've been just waiting for the young people to come home, you know? How do we do that in a safe way? How do we do that in a way that doesn't perpetuate um, the violence that we've all experienced? You know, like that's, I think for me, that's where I'm at. Um, and and I hope I get a chance at some point in time when I, when I do get there to share, to share that too. Cause I feel like that's another big, another big piece of this, like in terms of restoring who we are, you know? And so um, I think that's for me right now, as much as I can share, yeah. But it, I I know there's a there's a weight that we all feel that we all carry. It isn't ours. We're not meant to carry it alone. There we aren't alone with that. We have to, we have to know what that feels like to feel like the weight of our nation's on our shoulders, and there is a capacity that we can um, l like grow in to be able to carry that in a good way. And I think once we start learning about that we start to realize like there is knowledge in there there's that memory in there right that and that's what's going to lead us to that connection but we're not meant to just carry it we have to give it back to creation and say okay well what do i do with this that relation that re relationality that connection is vital to how we're to bring up the next generation you know that's as much as i've been shown and told miigwech I feel relative to those things. Like, I remember sitting at this, um, there was a talk 
in the, there's like a huge rotunda in uh, U of T. And Winona LaDuke, who's like this amazing, you know, she right now she's making like hemp. Like she's going full on hemp and it's incredible to watch them over there uh, in White Earth. So she came in and she was doing a panel with Christy Balcourt, Isaac Murdoch, a friend of mine named uh, Karen Rickley, who's a prof at U of T in uh, Women's Studies. And they were doing a panel I can't remember exactly. It was on the water, right? Um, and when Ona was doing uh, kind of like a, like she was sharing snapshots of um, Standing Rock and everything they've been going through over there with uh, Enbridge. And she started talking about the Wendigo economics and like the, ex like about fracking and how like, you know, all the good stuff that's easily accessible is gone. And now they're just like going right to the, like trying to find whatever they can pumping, you know, hydraulic yeah. fracturing and to, to spring up and collect up the last remaining natural nice. gas, you know. So I'm sitting there and it was in September, Josephine Mandamin, um, who I've been on water walks with and I, we do a lot of stuff together. There's a great love there. And um, she was at a water walk in tr downtown Toronto, they did. It's like a one day walk and I know she had been up since sunrise at least, like even maybe before, and she, it was like late. She came into the that room, and you gotta picture this like, um, when I get there, somebody says, "Hey, you're uh, you're Edward." I'm like, "Yeah," and they're like, "Okay, there's a special section for water protectors, like right at the front. It's like a, you know you have to go and sit over there." I'm just like, "Uh, <laughs> I just want to like." You know, be a fly on the wall. I don't want to be, like, recognized as a water protector, you know? Like, so weird. Like, you get in some of those spaces, you know? And you're like, this recognition is unnecessary because I didn't do it for that. I, I did it because there's there's a there was an urgency. There was a call. Like, when Josephine walked in, like, Christy stood up. Everybody, they stopped what they were doing. And people stood up. And she just comes walking out with their little walker. <laughs> I did it because there was a call from her and from other women like her, older women that had to do something. They picked up that water and they started praying. Like and they inspired an entire generation of us to to take meaningful action for the water. You know, that's why that's why I did it. <laughs> you know, not for the recognition part. And it's funny, you know, it's like real funny because people like idolize that and they lift that up, but which isn't always a bad thing, but. If you're not careful with your own self, then it can become not so much as a good thing, you know. She comes in, and then Isaac sits on the floor, like gives up his seat. He sits on the ground, like this is totally Isaac. These some of these ones that were there, like are like family. There's a, there's a relation out, like we all have a relation, you know. And like, those are the things as people that we celebrate, you know, those connections, you know. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like. I just started crying because I was like, I, that was the moment when I realized that this wasn't just something outside of myself that I'm engaging with. You know, this is, this is here. It's alive in here now. And there's a responsibility that I have. It was scary, you know, like when that call comes, whatever that call is, get up and go do it. Be there, show up, take a stand. That and and the more that we all do that together, that's how we, that's how we turn things around, you know. So, um, that's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's who I've become. That's who I'm becoming. You know, like, so I, I feel good to be asked, like, you know, to share a little bit of the knowledge that's come my way, the way in which I can take care of that knowledge because it's taking care of me. Um, I feel humbled by that and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about myself a little bit.